The Lord be with you. And also with you. From Psalm 46, God is our refuge and a strength, our very present help in times of trouble. Good morning and welcome to worship. I'm Reverend Bob Thompson and we are glad that you can join us for worship this morning through the internet. I want to thank our organist Eleanor Lane and our music director Becky Tisch for helping lead us in music this morning and for our children and youth minister Ashley Braystead for being our lay reader. I also again want to thank John Lane and Cole Finn for their work behind the scenes to record and edit this service so that you can see it. Our worship services are recorded and available through the internet at our website firstpresscheyenne.org and is always broadcast on KRAN Radio 103.3 FM at 8.30 on Sunday morning. To fully participate in worship, you'll need to go and download our bulletin and the announcements and the hymns so you can participate in worship this morning. If you have not done so, I encourage you to pause the worship service at this point and go and get those documents. We'll be sending out these announcements via email as well as our prayer chain, and we invite you to keep those people on our prayer chain in your prayers during the week. Today, again, we'll be having a virtual uh, fellowship time at 11 a.m. You should have received an email with the Zoom link. If you didn't, the meeting link is 841-7649-3045. As part of our church's response to racism, we'll be holding an eight-week seminar on faith and racial equity beginning soon in July. If you're interested in this, there's a flyer on our website, and you may call the church office and speak with Pastor Diana about the class. Birthdays that we are celebrating this week are Barbara Jean Buell, Julia Hay Siltzer, Ken Vines, T.J. Bartlebort, Brant Braisted, Greta Morrow, Cynthia Todd, Pam Mason, Joyce Swanson, and Katie Cooper. Happy birthday to everyone. And if you have an anniversary this week, we want to wish you a very happy anniversary. And now, may the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Please join me in the call to worship. Let us worship God, our light and our salvation. The, the Lord, Lord is the stronghold of our lives. We see God in this holy temple. We have, we have come, come with shouts of joy, joy and, and we, we sing to the Lord. Let us worship God in the spirit and truth. Teach, Teach us your ways, O Lord, and make straight our paths. Mighty God, we do not yet see the glory you plan for all humanity, but in the faith we see Jesus. We thank you for the humility and the holiness in which you lived and died. We praise you that he freed us from sin, that he comforts us and strengthens us through our struggles, and gives us courage to follow him. We join with all creation and sing your praise. Amen. to God who reigns above the God of all creation, the God of power, the God of love, the God of our salvation. With healing balm, my soul is filled, and every faithless murmur still. 
morning. I'm the Reverend Diana Hartman, and I invite you into this time of confession and pardon. Hear these words of calling to confession. The proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Trusting in God's faithfulness and compassion, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Please join with me in the prayer of confession. O oh Lord, our God, we are embarrassed to come before you, for we have preferred the ways of this world to your ways. We have rebelled against your wisdom, and we have gotten into trouble. We have rejected your word and have followed other paths. Most gracious Lord, filled with mercy and steadfast love, incline your ear to our cry. Hear us when we pour out our sorrows before you. Forgive us, not on the ground of our own righteousness, but on the ground of your great mercy and in the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray in his name, for he is our Savior and the mediator of your grace. And now let us take time for silent personal confession. Amen. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you. With the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. Believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Amen. Please join me for the prayer of illumination. Lord God, thank you for giving us your word in scripture. Send your spirit to help us understand your word, to grow in faith and to learn and love more. In Christ's name, pray. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson today is taken from Psalms 130. Out of the depths, I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voices of my supplication. If you, O Lord, should mark my inequities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be reverted. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits in his word, I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, I hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all the inequities. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Our New Testament lesson this morning comes from Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. Listen now to the word of God. Welcome those who are weak in the faith, 
but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. Also those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God. While those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord, and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us will be accountable to God. The word of the Lord. For our children's sermon this morning, we invite the kids to gather in front of your TV set or in front of your uh, computer. This is the 4th of July weekend, isn't it? And if you're familiar with the 4th of July, you're probably also familiar with our American flag. We have one here in our sanctuary. And what does the American flag have on it? And what does it stand for? Do you know that? Well, it has 13 stripes, and that stands for the 13 original states. It has a blue field filled with 50 stars. And those 50 stars each represent one of the states. And it's all on one flag. So 50 states united on one flag. Well, did you know that we also have a Christian flag? It's also here in our sanctuary. I want to show it to you today, and I have two helpers here. Can you guys, Brett and Gavin, can you help me by, let's pull this flag up here. Here you go. You guys take it. Are you going to hold that side? You're going to hold that in here? There we go. Right there. All right. Good job. Look at this flag. What do you notice about this flag? Once again, it's one whole flag, isn't it, Brett and Gavin? Uh-huh. And you see the white the big white field, white usually stands for purity, doesn't it? The purity of this flag stands for Jesus Christ. And of course, then we have the blue field, which represents the earth. And what do you notice in that blue field? What's right here? A cross. And what color is the cross? Red. Well, who was on the cross for us? Exactly. This represents that Jesus was on the cross and the, blood, and the red represents his blood that he shed for us. And once again, it's one flag. All those who believe in Jesus Christ and his, his death on the cross and resurrection are one united church. Isn't that good news? Let's pray. God, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for his coming to show us what it means to love to love you and to love each other. Thank you for his death on the cross and his resurrection that has given us new life and unite us all now in one church in his name. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Hey, thanks, Brent Gavin, for helping me. Would you pray with me? O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of every heart here be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, this being the 4th of July weekend, we are celebrating our country's independence. We have celebrated with flags, with colors of red, white, and blue, and with other reminders that we are the United States of America. 
But when did we as a country actually become united, joined together as one? I found it interesting that it was on September 9th of 1776 that our country was officially named the United States of America. And though we declared our independence on July 4th, 1776, it wasn't until some 14 years later, in 1790, that all of the original 13 states ratified our country's constitution. It should come as no surprise that ratification of our constitution did not occur without some disagreement and controversy amongst the politicians. You've heard how many politicians it takes to change a light bulb? Two, one to change it and another to change it back again. But we are the United States of America. Any examination of our history, though, would show several challenges to our being united. We had a civil war that threatened to divide us. The 1960s exposed a division in our country over racial equality. Today, again, we see our country is still divided. I'd like to paraphrase the great words of Abraham Lincoln. Now we are engaged in a great civil battle a civil conflict of politics and beliefs, a civil conflict regarding race and racism, testing whether this nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. As citizens of this United States, we recognize that it is rare that we all agree on anything, but we hope that our disagreements, our civil conflicts, will not permanently divide us, hoping that we can endure through this battle. Well, if we turn our eyes to the church, the Christian church. It should not surprise us that since the church is made up of people, there are also differences of opinion, and those opinions can divide the church into groups. But the Apostle Paul's message in Romans chapter 14 is that through our faith in Jesus Christ, and because of Christ's death and resurrection, we are to get over ourselves. Get over ourselves and look beyond our differences and be the united church the united body of Christ, and in that unity, we will glorify God. Well, evidently, according to Paul's words in Romans 14, verse 1, there was quarreling in the church over opinions. Now, I know that's hard to believe. Hard to believe that Christians would ever argue over religious differences. Pastor Diana, you and I have been in several churches, been several years. Can you imagine people in the church arguing over opinions? Hard to believe, right? Since nowadays we agree on everything. I've been told that to avoid conflict at social gatherings, it's best not to talk about politics or religion. Well, the opinions that the Apostle Paul is talking about here were not political opinions. They were quarreling over theological issues, over matters of faith. They were all worshiping the same God. They had come, come to the same faith and being baptized in the same name of Jesus Christ, but they were quarreling over theological practices of faith. They had two particular quarrels, the food they ate and the day they worshipped on. Group A believed they could eat anything. Group B believed eating only vegetables. They practiced their faith by abstaining from meat. Now we can tell already that this second group were not Presbyterians. We are known for our potlucks here, right? And we have just about every kind of food at those potlucks, and we have no qualms about eating it. Well, Paul labels these groups that are vegetarians as weak, which could be considered a derogatory term, but he clarifies that he's referring to them being weak in faith. It's not that their faith is weak. Their faith is as strong as anyone else's, but there is a weakness in their faith meaning there's a vulnerability that eating meat will harm their faith, while the other group does not have that weakness. But if we focus too much on who is weak and who is not weak, we're falling into the same trap that Paul is warning against. Paul's whole point is that we are not to pass judgment on others' faith practices, the faith practices of our fellow Christians. We are not to argue and quarrel with each other over how we worship and praise God. One commentator pointed out that if we quarrel with each other about whose faith practices are correct, we are falling into the trap of self-righteousness. We are demonstrating a self-righteous attitude. For no one argues and quarrels over matters unless one feels that one is right and the other is wrong. 
It's that self-righteous attitude that Paul's arguing creates divisions in the body of Christ. There were three men who died and went to heaven. St. Peter met them at the pearly gates, and he asked the first man, Welcome to heaven. Back on earth, what denomination were you? And the man says, I was a devout Presbyterian. St. Peter says, Excellent. Then go to door number 10, but when you pass door number 2, be very quiet. He then asked the second man, What denomination were you? And the second man replied, I was a pastor in the Methodist church. Wonderful. Make your way to door number six, but when you pass door number two, be very, very quiet. Then St. Peter asked the third man, what denomination were you on earth? The man says, I was a Lutheran. Wonderful. You go to door number 12, but be very quiet when you pass door number two. And the last man finally said, well, why is it we need to be so quiet when we get to door number two? Well, St. Peter replied, that's where the Catholics are, and they think they're the only ones here. Notice Paul doesn't show favoritism from one group over another. He doesn't claim one group is wrong and the other is right. Paul's focus is that both groups, as Bruce Ochtemeyer wrote in his commentary, both groups are in danger of allowing their convictions about proper Christian obedience in everyday matters to disrupt the community of faith. And it's this disruption of the community of faith the turmoil in the church that Paul is warning about. I like how Eugene Peterson wrote these verses in the message. Don't jump, over your, don't jump all over your fellow believers every time they do or say something you don't agree with. Remember, they have their own history to deal with. Treat them gently. It's notable, notable that this section of scripture in the NRSV is titled, Do Not Judge Another, while in Peter's message, it is, Peterson's message, it is titled, Cultivating Good Relationships. An important part of cultivating good relationships in the church is to not judge one another. But one of the challenges the society is facing right now is how to cultivate good relationships, how to cultivate relationships at all, particularly with people of different opinions. And our differences of opinion seem to be driving a wider wedge between us. And unfortunately, the church has not been a good model for the world to see. We have let differences, theological practices, divide the body of Christ into denominations. Within denominations, we have defined churches with homogenous theologies. And within churches, we have formed cliques. The world doesn't see the power of a unified Christian church because we continue to quarrel over practices that really don't matter. And as you might imagine, some of the most strident disagreements have been centered around two of our most important practices, our sacrament of baptism and the Lord's Supper. Even though each denomination takes the Lord's Supper in similar ways with bread and juice, each denomination has its own slightly different view of the Lord's Supper. And the practice of baptism is a dividing point between believers as well. There's a story of a Baptist and a Presbyterian who were arguing over the proper way to baptize a person. The Baptist was complaining because Presbyterians didn't practice full immersion. So the Presbyterian pressed and challenged the Baptist. He said, suppose I'm being baptized in a pool and I enter the water up to my neck. Is that good enough? No, the Baptist said, your head must be covered. So the Presbyterian pressed further. If I lower myself so that just my eyes are above water, is that good enough? No, the top of your head should go under water as well. Well, how about if I lower myself so my whole head is under water except for the very top? No, that won't be good enough either, the Baptist said. So the Presbyterian concluded. So it's the very top of my head that is most important, and we have that covered when we sprinkle people with water. All our words of proclaiming the love of God in Jesus Christ fall on deaf ears when the world sees a church divided over what seems like insignificant opinions. What the world needs to see is the fellowship of Christians gathered together, loving one another with a variety of theological practices and opinions. The Apostle Paul calls the church in Rome to welcome those who are weak in the faith. And by the substance of the rest of his scripture, he means it both ways. Those who eat anything and those who eat only vegetables are to welcome one another. 
Those who worship on a certain day and those who consider all days to be the same are to welcome one another. Again, I like how Eugene Peterson wrote this in the message. Welcome with open arms fellow believers who don't see things the way you do. The word welcome here means more than just to be pleasant and receptive. It means to welcome each other into the fellowship of the church. To welcome each other into the body of Christ as sisters and brothers in Christ. It's the same word used in chapter 15 verse 7 that demonstrates the love of God and gives glory to God. Welcome one another, it says, just as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. The Apostle Paul calls the church to welcome each other with open arms for three reasons. The first reason is that God has welcomed them. Verse 13 says that God has welcomed them into the body of Christ. And if God has welcomed them, who are we to block them? The second reason is that we belong to God. Paul's first argument against disciples judging one another is who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? We belong to God. It is God who is our master. We are God's servants. We do not belong to anyone else, nor is anyone else our servant. We are servants of God, and as Paul writes, it is before their own Lord that they stand or fall. So when we consider differences between fellow believers, we need to remember that it is only before God that we stand or fall, that we succeed or fail. And then Paul concludes, for we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Every knee will bow before God and every tongue will give praise to God. We will all be accountable to God. And in the middle of his passage, Paul proclaims God's graciousness to us. They will be upheld for the Lord is able to make them stand. The second reason then is that we belong to God. And as Paul reminds us in verse 6, we all do what we do to give glory to God, to give thanks to God. Those who observe a certain day, observe it in honor of God. Those who eat, eat to honor and give thanks to God. Those who abstain from eating, abstain in honor of God and give thanks to God. Whatever we are doing or whatever we're not doing, we practice to give glory and honor to God, not to one another. And the third reason we are to welcome fellow believers is that we belong to God fully through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul's third reason is that our whole lives belong to God and all that we do in our lives we do for the Lord. If we live to the Lord, if we die, we die to the Lord. So in everything we do in life, we do knowing that we belong to Jesus Christ, our Lord. To this end, Paul writes, Christ died and lived again so that he would be the Lord in all of our life and in our death. This third reason is the most important reason. We need to be unified as the body of Christ and welcome each other into fellowship because Christ came to live among us that we might know God. And Christ died and rose again to be Lord for all of us. Paul calls us to welcome fellow Christians, to welcome each other as Christ welcomed us for the glory of God. Our Westminster Catechism reminds us that our chief end, our main purpose in life is to glorify God. And we glorify God by welcoming fellow believers and being the united body of Christ. Our strongest demonstration of the church being united together is at the communion table. We all approach as sinners, recognizing the need for God's grace. And we all leave the table redeemed, redeemed through the body and blood of Jesus Christ, given new life through his resurrection. In the Apostles' Creed, we say each week that we believe in the Holy Catholic Church. This phrase raises the most questions for Protestant Christians, but the word Catholic here, with a small c, simply means universal or one. There's only one door that we all enter through. That's the door of Jesus Christ our Lord. This passage from Paul reminds us that as we gather for worship as a church, let us gather as the Holy Catholic Church the universal and worldwide church. Let us kneel before God and give praise to God through our one faith in Jesus Christ our Lord.
join with me now as we confess what it is we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, our Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise as high as the misting skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march on till victory. weekend of celebrating the independence and freedom that our nation enjoys on this new day filled with possibility and hope. We praise you, we thank you, we draw near to you. We pray for our nation that you would bless us and remind us to be a blessing to others around the world. We thank you for all that this country does to feed the hungry, care for the poor, and empower those who have no voice. For the myriad of chances we have to right grievous wrongs, 
and help our nation and other nations reach for peace. We thank you and continue to ask you for your guidance. We also come before you in confession, O oh God, that as a country we sometimes do what we ought not to do and allow sin to reign. We pass judgment where we lack understanding of our differences. And so hear our sorrow for the past and present, for missed opportunities, for places where we are broken, for squandered resources, for violence and greed, for inaction and silence that perpetuates racism. Forgive us and grant us your mercy. Lead us, O oh God, through the wisdom, compassion, and vision of our leaders into a future that is more faithful than we can even imagine. Bless this nation in ways that will allow freedom and justice to rain down and to wash over all people, not only in words, but in actions. We pray for our nation's leaders, for you to draw out the best that is inside of them as they serve this country and seek the common good. We pray for our military around the world, that they would be peacekeepers and be kept safe. And especially we pray for Master Sergeant Heather Smith, who has recently been deployed. As we celebrate our nation's independence and freedom, we are reminded, O oh God, of our freedom to choose you. And we do choose you. We are your servants to do your will. We draw near to the well to have our thirst quenched. Quench our thirst, O oh God our spiritual thirst that only you can satisfy. Bless us with a joy for justice and the strength to persevere as we work toward your coming realm. O Holy One, on this day we pray with joy, joining with those in our church who are in the midst of celebrating life's goodness. For the joy of celebrating birthdays, anniversaries, weddings, and births, we give you thanks, O God. Especially, we thank you for the birth of Waylon Ray Hugis, born to Libby Tedder Hugis, pastor of the table in Casper, and her husband on June 21st. And we also pray with sorrow, joining those who cry out to you, especially the Mueller and Reck families, as they mourn the loss and celebrate the lives of Margaret Mueller and Ellen and Bruno Reck. Be with them, O oh God, and stay near, surrounding them with your love and peace. Holy God, you call us to live out our faith in the context of our world, and so we pray for those areas of the world where need is great. We pray that vulnerable families of all ethnic and religious backgrounds will be fed in Iraq, Lebanon, and Syria and that all of our mission co-workers around the world, and especially El Marie and Scott Parker, would be daily strengthened to engage the ministry challenges of their context with creativity, energy, hope, and love. We pray for those who continue to be frontline responders to the pandemic. Fill them with strength, courage, faith, and compassion for the facing of these difficult days. Help them and all they care for to know your presence and to put their trust in you. We pray for all who hunger and those who worry each day how they will care for their families. Bless us all with meaningful work and fill us with good things as we love and care for each other and find our sustenance in you. We pray for all who suffer the violence and scars of abuse and discrimination especially the most vulnerable among us. Give them courage in the face of fear. In times of trouble, do not let their feet slip. Bless us with your vision of peace, for you have made us one family by giving life and breath to all. Attend to each need. Instruct us on how we might be instruments of your peace and your justice. We pray for all who are ill, recovering from illness, undergoing treatment, awaiting diagnosis or surgery. Especially we pray for 
Bob White and Lori Lamb, Alka Summer, Summers, Cheryl Lane, Eric Case, Onda Hupp, Debbie Lenhart, for all those suffering from COVID and all those on our prayer list for whom we have been asked to pray. May your healing spirit fill them and get, grant them wholeness and recovery. We pray for families in, tr in transition, those with aging parents that need special care, for those in nursing homes where visits are prohibited, for those who are moving from one city to another, for those who share the custody of children, and for those under stress for any reason. Bless them with the gift of faith, that they may know your love and love you. Uphold them in perseverance, patience, and compassion, and guide them by your spirit. In faith, we lift these, our concerns of the day, to your care, trusting that your will be done. Loving God, in whom we live and move and have our being, help us to choose life in you, that we may keep the commands of Jesus, follow the promptings of the Holy Spirit, and witness to the hope that is within us, sharing Christ's love in the world. Thanks be to you, O God, for our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray to you, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. God has shown us the meaning of generosity. He has abundantly blessed us and calls us to share our love and material possessions with others. Let us rejoice in what we have been given and in what is ours to give. We encourage you to make your contributions through the church website or by mail. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him. Join with me now in the prayer of dedication. We bring you these gifts, O oh God, from what we have first received from you. Use them, we pray, to enable the ministries of your church to flourish, as together we serve our neighbors, both near and far away, by showing love and doing mercy. Amen. celebration of the Lord's Supper. 
we remind you that this is not a First Presbyterian Church table. This is not even a Presbyterian table. This is the Lord's table, open to all who through faith in him welcome at this fellowship of this table. Let us prepare ourselves to receive the sacrament. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is holy and right and our joyful duty to give thanks to you, our Lord, our Creator, Almighty and everlasting God. You created the heavens with all its hosts and the earth with all its plenty. You have given us life and being, and you preserve us by your providence. You have shown us the fullness of your love by sending your Son, Jesus Christ, the eternal Word made flesh for us and for our salvation. For the precious gift of our mighty Savior, who was reconciled to us to you, we praise and bless you, O God. Most righteous God, we remember in this supper the perfect sacrifice offered once on the cross by our Lord Jesus Christ for the sin of the whole world. And through his sacrifice, we know that we are welcome at this table and in your kingdom. In the joy of his resurrection and in the expectation of his coming again, we offer ourselves to you as holy and living sacrifices. Send your Holy Spirit upon us, we pray, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be to us the communion of the body and blood of Christ. Grant that being joined together in him, we may obtain the unity of the faith and grow up in all things into Christ our Lord. As this grain has been gathered from many fields into one loaf, as these grapes from many hills into one cup, grant, O oh Lord, that your whole church may be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom through Christ our Lord. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he gathered his disciples around the table. And after giving thanks, he took bread and he broke it, saying, This is my body, broken for you. Take and eat. We invite you now to pass the bread around your table at your home with these words to each other, the body of Christ, broken And on that same night, our Lord took the cup and having poured it, he blessed it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take and drink all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant sealed with my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. So that whenever we eat this bread or drink this cup, we remember our Lord's life-giving life, death, and resurrection until he comes again in glory. I invite you now to share the cup with one another in your homes using the words, the blood of Christ shed for you. Join with me now with the prayer after communion. Loving God, you graciously feed us with the bread of life and the cup of eternal salvation. May we who have received this sacrament serve you faithfully. We who have sung your praises tell of your glory and truth. We who have seen the greatness of your love see you face to face in your kingdom. For you have made us your own people by the death and resurrection of your Son, our Lord, 
and by the life-giving power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. 